Well, we have Dan, Danny Lehman with us, and just in case uh, you uh, haven't been here before when Danny's been with us, Danny's been with uh, YWAM for a number of years, ever since we've, we've known him, probably about 30, 30 years or, or so, something like that. And, uh, <coughs> and the fact that you're here this morning has a lot to do with, with Danny because uh, this church grew out of a home fellowship started by Danny uh, over here in Callahale Hillside, just a few blocks away. Uh, and uh, Danny was... Uh, crazy enough to actually have me start teaching the study with him. I'm not still sure what got into him, but uh, uh, desperation, I don't know what it was, but uh, uh, it was a great, uh, uh, really formidable time in, uh, in our lives uh, spiritually. And We talk about having a certain spiritual D- DNA that comes about through your, your birth in Christ. Uh, it's influenced by those that are mentoring and teaching you uh, and kind of stays with you uh, throughout your life. So we're, uh, you're, you're kind of the the byproduct here of a little bit of uh, Danny's uh, influence uh, and mentorship over uh, us through the years. And so when we had the men's retreat on discipleship, there was one guy who wanted to be there to teach, and it's, uh, it was Danny Lehman. So we're happy that he was able to stay over before heading back to Kona and be with us this morning. So why don't you welcome Danny Lehman. Testing, test. Oh, good. It's working already. Well, it's great to be here with you folks. I actually came in, are we on? Yeah, uh, actually came in empty-handed today, and two or three people came up and said, uh, hey, do you have your books with you? And I said, well, I got them in the car. I'm on my way to the airport, and I figured, well, maybe there's enough people that are new that haven't heard me hawk my books before, but uh, I'll give it another shot. Uh, uh, first one is called Before You Hit the Wall, and that's if you need help in the area of personal spiritual discipline. Paul told Timothy to discipline himself for the purpose of godliness. So I just talked there about practical ways to set spiritual goals in your life, starting out with the new year, if, if you can, to have a, I do a fast and focus day every year, and I set certain goals in several different areas of my life, I break it all down, and um, I've done a lot of that since I wrote the book, but the basic gist of it is in the book, in which I talk about Bible study, Bible reading, Bible meditation, Bible memorization, and then uh, on into fasting and solitude and rest and physical exercise and diet and all that, uh, all around Paul's metaphor of running the race for Jesus uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So that's out there. We also have Beautiful Feet, Steps to a Lifestyle of Evangelism. This is uh, pretty much how you can witness on your job, in your neighborhood, wherever you are. It's got a little section on street evangelism, but mostly it's just about normal people reaching out where you are. So I talk about the message of the gospel, the messengers of the gospel, the motives on why we share the gospel, and then the methods of how we do it. And my latest one, the most one I'm most excited about, is the next big thing, how little choices make a big impact. And this is all about uh, those of us that feel a little inferior when we see a, a Greg Laurie or a Franklin Graham or someone like that up in the spotlight, and we think we're just, you know, mashed potatoes or something. And uh, some little thing that, uh, you know, in fact, a friend of mine was on a high school campus back in 1970 and gave an altar call on the high school campus and one of the kids that came forward was Greg Laurie. Now, uh, you know, we don't think about this guy or the guy that led that guy to the Lord, but it's all kind of a, 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 a kind of a serendipitous God up in heaven arranging little things to make big impacts. Like the guy that gave me a tract on the beach, a five cent tract and spent 15 minutes with me and my whole life was changed. So how little things make a big impact and I'd encourage you to get that if you can. Uh, there's no price on the books. Just uh, throw your, throw your uh, donations in the box. If you don't have any donations, that's fine. You can just take them, and uh, it'll lighten my load on the way to the airport. How's that for manipulation to get you to buy the books? Okay, uh, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're still getting a little ringing here. Should I move up or back? And um, actually, just a little bit of introduction uh, just by way of... Um, personal comments. Uh, my wife wanted to tell everybody hi. She couldn't be here. Linda, we just had a little game-changing situation. My mother-in-law just moved in with us about 10 days ago, and uh, I'm not complaining. I got the best mother-in-law in the whole world, and, and uh, she's got pretty severe dementia, so we're getting some coaching from uh, some of our friends on the windward side over here on how to deal with it, but uh, uh, it's really been fun. But um, my son Daniel is over there, and he's the head of all the worship on the YWAM campus over there, and we've got about eight worship teams if you really want an experience, come to Kona at 8 o'clock on a Monday morning and see a 1,000 young people just kicking out the jams and worshiping God in a very loud voice uh, with loud music, but it's fun. 
And uh, if you don't know about Youth with a Mission, it's a mission I've been involved with for about 33 years. We now have about 100 and, well, I should say we got 21,000 staff in 194 nations. And um, just seeing, if I, I could just talk all day long about things God's doing, maybe I should give you a couple reports since we're used to seeing the debates and all this other depressing stuff on television. But um, uh, a couple months ago, a very large mission organization, which is really good at raising money, which we are not good at raising money, uh, they came to see Lauren Cunningham, and uh, he's the founder, and, and he couldn't be there. So he said, Danny, could you meet with these guys? So I met with him. After about 15 minutes, I said, you know, it seems like a real easy partnership we can have here. You've got uh, money and Bibles, and we've got no money and no Bibles, uh, but we have the foot soldiers that can pass them out. So we made this deal. We ended up with $7.5 million worth of Bibles, and we're passing them out all over. Uh, we've got a goal we're almost through in Costa Rica. But then we made a deal with this uh, organization. They said, well, it has to be in suffering countries. I said, does Cuba there? I said, yeah, well, we got, a, we got a every home for Cuba campaign. And then I said, how about Nepal? They said, oh, yeah, definitely Nepal. So our first um, thing that is almost completed now was 43,000 homes in one, in one valley in which we're concentrating a lot of our workers to go there to give out free Bibles, preach the gospel door to door. And in most parts of Nepal, there's no, not that much persecution, so we're able to get away with it, working with local pastors to follow up on the converts, and uh, it's been really good. So that was a partnership with one organization. Just last week, all of the international directors of Wycliffe Bible Translators met with us, and we're doing a concentrated effort on getting the Bible into every, not only the languages of Papua New Guinea, but into the various dialects in Papua New Guinea. We also had a $6 million ship partially given to us and partially we raised the money for down in Townsville, Australia. I was just there for the christening of the ship uh, just about three or four months ago, and now we're going back and forth from Townsville, Australia, raising money and going in, taking doctors and dentists and so forth into Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea probably has more missionaries per capita than any other country in the world, but it's still in one of the most abject poverty situations. There's violence everywhere, uh, a lot of horrible things happening, but a lot of good, good Christians in leadership of the nation who want Papua New Guinea to be a Christian nation. In fact, if you talk to the leaders of the nation, it puts us to shame on what we were founded on. And these guys really want to be a nation that honors Jesus Christ. And there's one dentist for every 150,000 people there. And uh, then there's doctors are almost just as bad. And especially out in the boonies or out in the far islands. Another thing that's happened to us just recently, we had a, not a split, but a, a, an amiable parting of the ways with Mercy Ships, uh, which was our big Anastasis ministry. And we had a giant ship called the Africa Mercy. And so because of the possibility of oil spills and liabilities, we said, well, it might be better for you to go on your own with this big ship. And, but God, since then, that was about eight or nine years ago, has provided 21 new ships for us from around the world, most of them small, so they can get into some of these remote islands uh, that get a, get a visit every six months. From, uh, and we're seeing people come to Christ. Uh, we're obviously multiplying Bibles and multiplying Bible translations and so Lots of exciting things happening. I'm personally, my wife and I uh, are, it's hard to, it, it's taken a while, but we're happy campers in Kona. <laughs> I used to say, they don't even have a zippies over here, you know. <laughs> but um, uh, Kona is, uh, <laughs> it's not a beautiful place, it's just a bunch of lava rock. <laughs> but uh, uh, my mission is over there, and so we originally went over because the founder asked us to move over. I had worked myself out of a job here in Honolulu, uh, and I was kind of bouncing around the world. Uh, on kind of a freelance uh, preacher kind of a thing, and they, uh, plus doing a lot of international leadership. So the founder asked me to come over and help put in some real focus, and that's part of what my message is growing out of today, is the whole issue of we're stewards on what God has given us, uh, sometimes on a macro level like we're talking about, or sometimes on a micro level with just your job or your relationships with your kids or your families or the dollar God has put in your pocket. Whatever it is, we're stewards of what God has given us, and uh, in light of that, there's a verse in First uh, Peter chapter 4 that says uh, we are stewards of the manifold grace of God because of the gifts that God has given us. And uh, when I first went over there and I was kind of in an executive position over all these training, we've got about, uh, uh, we have an average of about 20 missionary training schools at any one time. About eight or nine of them are discipleship training schools. And then we've got discipleship training school leaders. And then we've got people doing aquaculture, and we've got people doing all kinds of farming experiments, and then we've got the Bible translations, and we've got medical ministries and all this. And I just got swallowed up in, in the administration, and I don't have one administrative bone in my body. And I've been able to get away with it for years because I always had a secretary, but I don't have one now. And then I just, 
And anyway, it just worked out now where I'm on four different leadership teams. One has to do with unreached peoples. One has to do with the training going on in the campus. One has to do with the uh, impact of our training, which is, are we really making a difference? And we had the, the theme this weekend, are you making disciples or not? So I, I, hold the, I hold the heat pretty hot under our young leaders when they get back from outreach, and I say, it's great that you did a lot of good things, but how many disciples did you make? How are we multiplying the gospel into all the world? And uh, it's just really been fun being able to be a part of that. And uh, uh, my job at this part of my life is just to get under the leader, young leaders and raise them up, and we've got tons of good 20-something leaders. I was talking to somebody recently, and they said, uh, oh, so Danny, you're, you're mostly discipling the guys that are, that are your son Daniel's age. I go, no, Daniel's one of the old guys. <laughs> Daniel's 35. He's an old man. We want to go down into the 18 to 25-year-olds, and that's where we really need to get our leaders who can lead us into the future. So we're not going to be satisfied until we've reached every person in the world with the gospel and done our best to disciple every people group that we can. And uh, we've obviously got a big job to do, which brings me to my text today. Um, I can't go verse by verse through all that's in here, but um, just to give you a little bit of a background, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and he's always trying to uh, come up with word pictures, metaphors, similes, uh, anecdotes, something to help us understand. It's part of the teaching process. Most of us do it if we're teachers. We're always trying to give illustrations and so forth. So at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he's wrapping up a discussion on disunity in the body of Christ and how we need to be all for one and one for all. And then he uses a couple of metaphors here. He starts out in verse 6 saying, I planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he that waters is anything, but only God who makes it grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Then he switches metaphors, and he goes, we are God's fellow workers in the field, and you are God's field, and you are God's building. So now he's going from agriculture to architecture, and he says in verse 10, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. Now this is probably more applicable to those of us in leadership, but Paul the Apostle called himself an expert builder. The Greek word there means a expert architect. Uh, he's not, in our common understanding of those words, there's a difference between an architect and a builder. Uh, and so it's, it's the person who visualizes what the building is going to be like, and he makes the plans, and so then builds according to the plans. And he says, I'm an expert builder. Now, if I came, came to you today and said, well, I'm an expert this, or I'm an expert that, you might say, well, you're kind of full of yourself to call yourself an expert. You know, let somebody else call you an expert. And, and I would understand your reticence to let me get away with it. But Paul was not full of himself, and he was not a cocky person. He was a person that says, hey, I'm, by the grace of God, I'm a wise master builder or an expert builder. In other words, I know what I'm doing. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not bragging if it's true. Right? So he just said, I'm an expert builder. I know what God's called me to do. I know what I want to accomplish, and I know how I'm going to get there. And you are God's building, and you are God's field. And so as he's giving that as a background... He said, I've laid the foundation and someone else is building on it. But let each one be careful how he builds. And that's when, when we're going to jump to the issue of stewardship, which is another metaphor, that how do we do what we do? And so in my role in, in missions leadership is to encourage people, it's good to build, but you've got to know how you're going to build. One of the illustrations I give to our young workers is, you know, you're all young, young and zealous and you have a lot of physical energy and a lot of spiritual energy and a lot of zeal for God, but you got to have wisdom. The whole book of Proverbs, for instance, Proverbs 4, 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, with all you're getting, get understanding. So understanding, wisdom, uh, using your brains, loving God with all your mind is not antithetical to the work of the Holy Spirit. We need the work of the Holy Spirit to keep us fired up for God, but we also need basic common sense, common horse sense, spiritual wisdom that God gives, gives us. And that's why Paul said, let every man take heed how he builds. So an illustration I give is I say, I say, hey, we have these things called work duties on our campus over there. So we'll send the students out to cut the grass or trim the bushes or work in the kitchen just to just kind of help keep things going to save us money. And I said, let's say some of you went over here and I gave you a a um, objective to build to dig me a six foot hole six foot wide six foot square six foot deep and uh, when you get it built and you get it dug 
fill it back up, and then go dig another six by six by six hole. On the other hand, if I tell you guys to go over on this part of the campus and make me a tomato garden, uh, let's come back and see uh, how we do. Now, you have done an adequate amount of work. You got more sweat. You might have worked even harder with the lava rock and so forth, which is all over Kona. You know, you're going to dig that little hole. But you have tomatoes. In other words, you've accomplished something. So there's a big difference in what we do and what we accomplish. And oftentimes, and I just confess this, looking around at mission organizations and sometimes our own organization, we do a lot but don't accomplish a lot. So one of the things we got to do is put it under the microscope of the Word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit and be wise master builders, knowing where we're going and how we're going to get there. Now, how does it apply to us as individuals? I think it's the same thing. We are, have been given a field. We have been given a building. And we have been given a family. And that's what I want to jump to now, which is our main text in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Paul says, So then... Men ought to regard us as the servants of Christ or the slaves of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. I have an NIV here, and I really don't like this translation. The translation is, he's, he's made us to be stewards of the mysteries of God. King James gets it right here, uh, but I've got a modern translation. Verse 2 We've been entrusted with the secret things of God. The Greek word for secret things is mysteries. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust or a stewardship must prove faithful. So the title of the message today is Foundations of Faith. And uh, as I was just praying about the, the message this morning, I felt like I wanted to encourage you to go back to the foundations of your Christian life. If you're 50 years old in the Lord or you're five days old in the Lord, it says in Psalm 11, verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed... What shall the righteous do? It says in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, Paul said, you know, I want to tell you about Melchizedek. I want to tell you about all this deep stuff, but I can't because you're babies and you got to get back to the foundational teachings of scripture, repentance and faith and so forth. So foundations are very important. Uh, I'm a cement mason, so I know a little bit about foundations. And I remember when I, when I used to work construction work, the guy everybody hated on the job was the inspector. We got any construction guys here? And the oh, oh, here comes the inspector. And of course, you know, you go out and buy him a six pack. I wouldn't do this, of course, being a good Christian. <laughs> but the other guys would buy him a six pack of beer or do whatever he could to try to butter up the guy so that he doesn't shut the job down. I'll never forget, I was with uh, some guys from Ralph Moore's church back in the day, and I was trying to make some money on the side, so I hired myself out to this construction company. We were putting in the Kaimuki um, firehouse. And we had to put a second story on the Kaimuki Firehouse. And uh, Ralph Urbellino, does anybody remember old Ralph? Little Italian stallion guy. You know? so, so it was going on his jobs, you know. So we're, um, we're pouring the concrete in. And then you have what you call a cold joint, which is how the new concrete matches the old concrete. And you can't let that cold joint go too long uh, because it, it creates a bad bond. And so the inspector's watching us, you know. And... We poured out the first concrete truck, and then the second concrete truck calls up and says, I'm stuck in traffic on the freeway. And uh, we're all getting nervous and so forth. And so the um, inspector comes over and says, okay, I'll give you five more minutes. If that concrete truck doesn't get here in five minutes, I'm going to shut the whole job down. And the boss turned around to the rest of us and says, that means we've got to jackhammer this whole thing out and start again. And oh. And uh, they called Ralph and got him praying and everything. But anyway, it worked out where the, the guy, I think it was six minutes, and the guy gave us a minute of grace. But um, we, were, we were being really nice to that inspector the whole time that he was there. And, but inspectors are important, and it's good for us to inspect the work that we do. It's good to evaluate the work we do. One of the things that makes mission organizations ineffective is they don't have anybody from the outside evaluating them. They evaluate themselves. And how many of you know it's easy to pat yourself on the back <laughs> and say, hey, we're doing a pretty good job? Well, you might not be doing a great job, and it's good to have objective safety in a multitude of counselors. This is why we have a wonderful relationship with Campus Crusade for Christ, which is renamed Crew recently, uh, and some of the other mission, mission boards of the world. It's to help keep us all accountable because we, as the worldwide missions movement, are stewards of the most wonderful mystery in, in the universe, which is the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection and the salvation of the whole world. So it's a, it's a stewardship that we have that we have to be 
I was serious about. Now, getting back to this word steward, back in those days, uh, and this is most likely the imagery that Paul is drawing from here, there were these, I wouldn't want to call them plantations, but they would be like households. And a household, the Greek word here is oikos. And in a family, which is the word oikos means family or household, you have um, various roles that different people play in the household. So first of all, you have the oikos, which is the house or the family. Then you have the householder, who is the owner of the whole house. And uh, oftentimes you have uh, the household, which is extended people, much like our Hawaiian uh, ohana houses or or aunties and uncles that live with us and so forth. You have a nuclear family, then you have aunties and uncles and grandmas and so forth and so on. And so they would have that back then. And then the householder would own the whole thing. And then you'd have the extended family. And he, of course, wanted to take care of those that were in his family. But there was another couple of people there. There were the household slaves or servants, and then there were the household stewards. The slaves just did the work but it was the steward's job to be the kind of middleman between the householder and the work that needed to be done. So on Monday morning, the householder, the steward, I'm sorry, the steward would go to the householder and say, boss, um, uh, what do you want me to do this week? Well, I, uh, I want to meet so-and-so at Zippy's at, uh, on lunch on Wednesday, and on Friday I want to fly to Kauai, and I want to do this, and then I, I want to have a picnic for my uh, employees on on Thursday, oh, I, I just saw that uh, there's, a, there's a special on chicken at Costco. Would you like me to get it? Yes, do that. And so the, bo- the, the steward would try to save the boss money, and he would try to manage his household as best as he could because he was the steward of the household. And so um, this, this issue of stewardship is all over the Bible, and I want to suggest uh, three areas uh, that we can have our stewardship in, and then I want to try to get as practical as we possibly can. Number one is we need to be stewards of the faith. And I put a capital T on the word the as a definite article. There's something in the Bible called the faith. It says in Acts chapter 2, they continued in the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. In the book of Jude, Jude was kind of like the writer to the Hebrews. He said, you know, I wanted to write to you folks a gospel tract to explain to you about this glorious salvation that we have in Christ, but... Um, I found out that we have to earnestly contend for the faith which was once for all entrusted to the saints. Um, I do a lot of studying. Uh, we got some young people here today. I do a lot of studying on youth and uh, what is attracting youth to the church, what's not attracting youth to the church. I was telling the guys, I just spoke with um, a very eminent apologist by the name of Oz Guinness, kind of a worldwide known guy, but he was in Honolulu. And I had a chance to uh, MC the meeting and do some speaking uh, last, last weekend. And um, I was talking to him about it, and he lives in Washington, but he's, he's a British guy, so he's very familiar with what's going on in Europe and so forth. And we were just talking about why young people are leaving the church. And we, we, we church growth people come up with ideas, and well, maybe we get them some smoke bombs or some strobe lights, or we can do this and kind of make it more sexy, and uh, you know, let's have really rock music, or let's do this or that, and let's have couches in the room instead of chairs. And, and you know what the young people are saying? I read four different books in preparation for my ministry there last week. One was called You Lost Me, which is young people saying to us, you're losing me, you better do something. And then uh, there's another book called Unchristian, which uh, talks about how young American people view the church. We're homophobic, we're, we're intolerant, we're uh, right-wing, we are warmongering, and, and a lot of these things are overstatements, and we can say you're judging us wrongly, but this is what they say according to the surveys. Another guy's an author who heads up the Barna Group, who does a lot of research in this area. They say between 43 and 59 percent, depending on the denomination, of young people when they graduate from high school, even if they're in a really hot youth group, a really biblically-based church with people who love them, with great parents, oftentimes between 43 and 59 percent after they, if they geographically go away, like if they go from Dallas, Texas to Oklahoma or Ohio State or Florida State, if they physically go away, away from the protection of their parents and so forth, they get hammered by the secular humanists, they get hammered by the professors, they get hammered by the party animals, they get hammered by the cults, and it's really hard for these young people to stand. That's why things like the Truth Project that Dr. Dobson did a few years ago and studying biblical Christian worldview is so important to young people. It's not enough just to give them Bible stories. We have to give them how the Bible stories relate 
to every arena and area of life, which is what our founding fathers understood. But we've kind of allowed the devil to push us into a corner where you just do your little Bible studies and prayer meetings and let the world go. And yet, Jesus said we need to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And we need to be involved in our world uh, to help it be as close as we can to being pleasing to God. Trying to fulfill Jesus' commandment to pray that we would have his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But uh, the issue with the young people, you know what they're saying back in all of the surveys? These four books were from four different streams of the body of Christ. You know what they said? We don't need your smoke bombs and strobe lights. We don't need you to try to make the gospel cool. The gospel's not cool. We want you to tell us the truth. And we want to see older people who are examples of Jesus Christ where we can follow their lead. And I was challenging the guys up at the, up at the retreat. I know it's hard to do that, and the burden shouldn't be on you to go to a young person and say, could I please disciple you? Could I please mentor you? I mean, that's very difficult. But it's up to the young people to go and say, I want to be mentored. I want to be discipled. I want to know what... I love it when young people come to me and say, Danny, give me five books that changed your life. I'm oh, happy to do that. I'll give you ten. And then just be able to help them, to be able to encourage them. And, and uh, uh, I'm an early to bed, early to rise kind of guy. But if I got somebody late at night that wants to pick my brain about the kingdom of God, I'll stay up till midnight because I want to help young people to grow into the fullness so they might be able to handle the stewardship God is giving to them. So the faith. One of the things about young people that they have, to, this is, uh, again, according to the surveys, they're much more impressed with behavior than they are... Uh, Belief, they, in other words, it uh, doesn't really matter what you believe, it's, it's, it, you'd be like Jesus. And so one of our jobs is no, we do need good behavior, and we confess we haven't had the greatest behavior. Rick Warren sent out a, um, uh, a survey to a couple hundred thousand pastors in, in 2011, this was in Christianity Today magazine, said 40% of pastors, and this is a direct quote from the Christianity Today article, 40% of pastors st- struggle with addiction to pornography. He's not just talking about walking by a magazine rack with a swimsuit edition of Sports Illustrated. He's talking about hardcore pornography. And if the pastors are like that, then the rest of us guys and the women are catching up into this whole arena of like a new temptation. Now, we've always had our Playboy magazines and all that, but we are breaking records on porno websites and so forth. And so when the young people look at us older people and we're doing the same thing the world's doing, how can we expect them to change? So we need to, as Paul told Timothy, be an example of the believers in your words, in your faith, in your conduct, in your purity, and let the young people be able to follow you as you let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So the young people just basically say, we want to see authenticity. And how many of you know that's not a bad challenge? I want, to, I want somebody to be in my face. If I'm not being like Jesus, I want to hear about it. I was telling the guys a story yesterday that I was preaching at a church one time, and this, I was packing up my books on my way to go to the airport. I, I'm out in the middle of Oregon somewhere. And this woman came up and said, I need to talk to you. And I said, uh, okay. And she said, my husband just left me and my kids are all a mess. And first thing that went through my mind was wrong place, wrong time, wrong person. I'm not even a pastor if I did live here. Uh, you need to go to your pastor. You need to go to somebody that knows you. You didn't get into this mess in the last five minutes. You're not going to get out of it in five minutes. I can't help you. I'm on my way to the airport. That's what's in my mind. And she could smell that. She could smell my reluctance to get into a conversation with her because I had to go to the airport. And um, she let me have it. You know, I came up here pouring out my heart to you, and you're so busy with you. And, of course, I could have rode on my high horse and said, well, you're the one bringing it up at the wrong time and so forth. But... Um, Uh, I I apologize to her. But then when I went to the airport, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me really clearly. He said, Danny, how would Jesus have treated her? What if Jesus was on his way to the airport? Would he have given her those vibes? Or would Jesus have made her the most important person in the universe? I said, I think Jesus would have handled it a little different than I did. And so I tried to learn from that. But I try to learn from my mistakes. And that's what a disciple is, is a person who learns. So um, The whole issue of the faith, yes, we need to encourage believing and we need to encourage good behavior, but we also have to return to the simplicity of the simple gospel of Christ. How many of you were raised in a church where they said something like this on a regular basis? Let's all stand. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered and died, etc. And we can recite that Apostles' Creed or Nicene Creed. Why did the early church think that was so important? 
I've had young people come to me and say, Danny, you talked to me like I was given a Greek word study once on, um, on how they came up with the Nicene Creed. And what it was all about was, who was Jesus Christ? And Constantine the emperor said, I'm not a theologian. You guys figure it out and let me know who was Jesus. And one guy was saying, Jesus is true God of true God, begotten, not made. The other guy was saying, Jesus is a created being. This guy's name was Arius. He was a heretic. He was banished. And Athanasius ended up winning the day. But why did they fight over that? So I had a young person recently come to me and say, Danny, homo usias, homo asias, who cares? What, you know, it merits that we know Jesus. No, we've got to know the right Jesus. And so doctrinal precision is not the be-all and end-all of the game changers, but doctrinal precision is important, but it doesn't fly very hard unless it's accompanied by a Christ-like loving power of the Holy Spirit within our lives. Number two, we have to uh, have foundations of our faith in the area of faith itself. So if you're taking notes, we're going to talk about the faith, which is a noun, and now we're going to talk about faith, which is a verb. And uh, I want to encourage you, before we get into the real practical stuff here, is that um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, don't look at the things which you can see. Because the things which you can see are temporary, but the things that you cannot see are eternal. I feel like going to Paul the Apostle when I get to heaven and say, Paul, why did you say that? How can you look at things you can't see? Don't look at the things that you can see. Oh, so I can't look at the things I can see, but I, yeah, because Hebrews eleven six says, faith is by definition the substance of things you hope for and the evidence of things you cannot see. And I got a prophecy for you. You, you get a lot of bang for your buck this morning. I'm not only a Bible teacher, I'm a prophet. <laughs> Thus says the Lord, everything that is going on in your life right now, whether it is Sometimes coming from the devil, sometimes coming from sinful people, sometimes coming from your flesh, sometimes coming from good stuff that God's trying to do in you. All of that God is trying to use to help you to trust Him. As Hannah Whitehall Smith said in her classic book, it's the Christian secret to a happy life. And God loves you so much, He allows you sometimes to go through the dark night of the soul or to go through testing times in order that we might be able to grow in our faith because... Without faith, it is impossible to please God, according to Hebrews 11.6. And then, of course, it tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.7, we walk by faith and not by sight. So we must live uh, believing God. Number three is an adjective, and that's the issue of faithfulness. And so now I want to go full circle and come back to our issue of stewardship. Let me give you a couple of areas that I think would help encourage you if you see yourself to be a steward. You're a steward of what God has given you. The Hawaiians would call it a, a kuleana. It's your, it's your area of responsibility. Number one, and the most important, it might surprise you, is take care of yourself. Last Sunday morning, uh, long story short, you're going to wonder why I was in a gym on Sunday morning rather than in church. But uh, I, had a, I had a late morning flight, so it was too late for me to go to a church so I got up early, and I decided to go to the 24-Hour Fitness. I have a lifetime membership there. So I'm, I'm walking into the 24-Hour Fitness, and I see a pastor of one of the largest churches on Oahu. I said, bro, what are you doing here on Sunday morning? He said, oh, I'm under doctor's orders. I said, really? He's, and now this guy's a young guy. I'd estimate he's about 34, 35. And uh, the doctor told him, if you do not slow down, and I'm not talking about a two-week vacation, if you don't take time off, you will die as a young man with a heart attack. The guy was so stressed out and so built up, and he was so busy because, obviously, he had a big church and so forth. And uh, so I laid hands on him right there in the gym and prayed for him, and I said, go get some rest, and tried to encourage him. But um, a lot of people, because those of us that are involved in ministry, and if we love the Lord, yes, we're going to... I've come close to burning out several times. I mean, we got a world to evangelize. I mean, we got people going to hell. We've got the poor that need to be reached. we got to reach them. But how many of you know I'm no good to God if I burn my body out? There was a famous preacher named Robert Murray McShane. Died when he was 29 years old. And allegedly on his deathbed, he said, God has, he's a, he was a preacher. He said, God has given me a horse to ride on and a message to deliver. Alas, I have killed the horse and I cannot deliver the message. Is that sad? This guy last week, I said, bro, you're killing the horse. And so he's getting taken care of and he's, He's going to take his time off, and hopefully he'll be fixed and be back with us in a couple of months. But he's taking three months off just for survival. 
So let us be careful. A.W. Tozer said, keep the, keep the fire hot, but the chimney cool. <laughs> so we need to be able to just learn how, and I have learned how to take Sabbath days. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist, but I, I do my best to take a good day off every week so I can go to the beach or I can hang with my grandkids or I can just space out in my library or do something in order to bring rest to my soul. One of the, I really miss having a Borders bookstore. That's another thing Kona doesn't have is a bookstore. But um, I really miss going in. One of of the best ways I can bring rest to my soul is to go into a Borders or a um, Barnes & Noble and just space out. I have no, I just float over it. Oh, there's some old Beatles books here. I wonder what they were doing. You know, and there's a little article about uh, this. And I'll go over to World War II section. And then I'll just, just, just letting my mind rest from the demands of Scripture and so forth. I mean, the demands of the ministry and so forth. We need to take care of ourselves We need to take care of our hunger for God. Uh, We need to take care of our health. I'd recommend a book. If you tend to be a type A personality and you tend to be the kind of person that's constantly on the edge of exhaustion or burnout, I want to recommend a really good book. It's by a Christian medical doctor and it's called Margin. And uh, he wrote another book after that called The Overload Syndrome. Basically, he was saying the same thing that we've got to take stewardship over our physical bodies and stewardship over our emotional resiliency. Different ones of us can handle stress in different ways, and the guy next to you might be able to handle 10 tons of stress, and you can only handle 10 pounds of stress. You've got to steward yourself so that you don't allow yourself to get into situations that fry you and make you that much more um, ineffective in the ministry. But this guy defines margin as the difference between your load and your limits. And uh, your, your load of what you can carry and what your limits are. Did anybody, was anybody here, in, well, you were all in high school. But in high school, did you ever see the film of when the Tacoma Narrows Bridge um, fell apart? You might remember it. It's a, it. You can see it on YouTube. Just Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And it has this bridge, and somebody was taking a film. I think it was back in the 50s or 60s. And uh, these cars were going across the bridge, and I guess there was just this perfect storm of wind that came down this little valley and ended up hitting the Tacoma Narrows, and the, the concrete bridge started to swerve like this, and then went like this, and cars were flying off of this bridge, and the bridge was made out of concrete. And of course, there was lawsuits and everything that came out of it, but it was that the people who were building the bridge did not lay a proper foundation for the bridge. They said on every bridge you have to have what's called the dead weight, In other words, the bridge needs to hold itself up. Then it's the functional weight, which is if the bridge is a a, a, um, bridge for trucks or it's a bridge for trains, it has to have a proper amount, you know, adequate rebar and concrete and so forth and so on. And then the third is the stress level, and that's when you have wind and hurricanes and things like that. You have to build with that in mind, and apparently they didn't do that. Uh, There's been several... uh, places in Latin America where soccer stadiums have collapsed with the upper deck to the lower deck because somebody was on the take and didn't properly inspect the concrete and the rebar that was going into that situation. So I think that's a kind of a little bit of a a metaphor for our own lives as we build our bridges that God can use and help other people. Second thing in 1 Corinthians 4.2, it says we are stewards of the mysteries of God. We have this wonderful thing called the gospel. And it's interesting that in the early church, if you study not only in the book of Acts, but if you study, book of Acts is about 30 years, if you study the first two, three, four centuries of the church, you'll see there was two main ways that the devil attacked the church. One was obviously persecution from the Jews, persecution from the Romans, martyrdom and all that kind of stuff. But the devil just looked around after he persecuted us and a guy by the name of Tertullian once said, hey... The more you persecute us, the more we multiply. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And he wasn't being arrogant about it. He was just saying, we're going to multiply because we believe in eternal life. We believe in the mystery of the gospel that a a crucified criminal died on the cross is the salvation of all human beings, and we're willing to die for it. And uh, and that was something that came out of uh, uh, that particular area. But the second area that we have uh, attacked is in the area of internally of what we would call heresy. Now, a heresy is not just somebody that doesn't agree with you, like somebody else's post-trib and you're mid-trib or pre-trib or om that kind of stuff. Jesus is going to come back when he's going to come back, although we all believe he's coming pre-trib. Settle that. 
But we might be wrong. You never know. But I'm not going to divide from brothers and sisters in the body of Christ over that. But there are some things where you, where, that are game changers. And something that you'll find in every revival, there's always going to be somebody that comes up with some new, what, what the book of Ephesians calls a wind of doctrine. I was talking to Pastor Chuck Smith about this one time, and uh, we were talking about some teaching, and he said, oh, Danny, don't worry about it. They blow in and blow out. And in a couple of years, it won't be here any longer. And, and he was right. But uh, they usually revolve around what is the content of the mystery. Now, this is really interesting. Paul the Apostle was a missionary at heart. And what missionaries always do, and this is applicable to you and your neighbors and your friends, your relatives, if you're trying to lead them to Christ, one of the things you want to do is to look for interest doors. Uh, we just had a, a, a country open up, the Buddhist country called Bhutan. And um, uh, we have some friends in Nepal that knew some people in Bhutan, but we have some young guys over in Kona that are, that are into CrossFit. Anybody know what CrossFit is? It's kind of a hyperactive kind of a... Uh, physical fitness kind of a thing and a couple of our guys over in Kona are champions in this particular area and one thing after another we met the princess of Bhutan something else happened and another connection it usually costs you $250 a day to go into Bhutan on a tourist visa we're getting free visas to go in and to do CrossFit training to young people all over this nation with the princess giving us the the, the uh, open door to be able to do it and they said well we we want to bring Jesus in. Yeah, you can bring anything you want. Just be careful. And so, um, so we're, we're using that as an interest door to be able to share the gospel. It's interesting. In John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Greek word for word was logos. You get any Bible dictionary and look up what the word logos originally meant, and it was an impersonal ideal that the Stoic Greek philosophers had for uh, logic and reason and you know real thinking and you don't want to get too high or low on your emotions and you want to just be a and um, and uh, John the uh, beloved basically said you want logos I'll give you logos in verse 14 of John chapter 1 and the logos became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the father in other words you want logos I'll give you logos so he used a concept that in their culture was something that was it was an aspiration that they had, but they didn't realize their aspirations were going into the wrong place. So he says, you want a Logos? The Logos is not an impersonal, foggy thing out there that we attain by philosophical speculation. It's Jesus Christ himself. He is the Logos of God, the divine Logos. Similarly, in Ephesians and Colossians, they're both two real similar epistles. Both of them talk about the word mystery, which is the word mysterion. Now, in that day, there were lots of false teachings going around, heresies, and they were called mystery religions. This was before the Gnostics, but this was uh, Osiris and Mithrash and others. And basically, Paul said, you know, Christ is the mystery of God. Great is the mystery of godliness, the scripture says. And right here, it says, we are stewards of these mysteries of God. I had a privilege... Um, uh, it's about two years ago. We have a guy that we're connected with. He's not in Youth with a Mission, but he's got his own ministry. But he's, he's working with the uh, Green family, who are the Hobby Lobby people. And uh, they're working on making a Bible museum in Washington, D.C. to just try to help exalt the Bible as the answer to the world and so forth. It's a wonderful thing. And this one guy, his name's Dr. Scott Carroll. He's kind of like, uh, they call him the Indiana Jones of the body of Christ. <laughs> he's this... He's this archaeologist guy and spends most of his time digging around little holes and so forth. But he brought to Kona, he had this manuscript like from the third century or something of one of the books of the Bible. And so the Green family is helping him finance what he does. And I was actually sitting in a small meeting with about six people and he says, you guys, this is the oldest fragment of a manuscript of the book of Luke in existence. I said, can I touch it? He says, no, you can't touch it. <laughs> Because, but it was in a little, pla little, little airtight um, glass box. So I, I picked up the box and I looked at it. And I went home and I told my wife, I said, this hand just touched the oldest living fragment copy of the book of Luke. I'm not going to wash this hand for a week. <laughs> Some people would like to shake uh, Beyonce's hand, but I'd rather have the oldest copy of the book of Luke. Uh, number three, we need to be stewards over the gifts that God has given us. God has put, in a, put a certain amount of gifts, calling, even your personality, your culture, 
all of that is, even if your culture is fallen and twisted or whatever, your family, well, man, my family's full of alcoholics and, you know, dysfunctional. It's all right. It's under the sovereign hand of God. And even with all that, positive, negative, God wants you to be required to be a good steward of what he's put in your hand. Um, oh, this is golly. Over 10 years ago now, there was this tsunami that happened that hit, uh, I'm not talking about the Japanese uh, tsunami, but the one that happened before that that hit India, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and worst of all, Indonesia in Banda Aceh. 250,000 people were killed. It was a horrible thing. It was during the Christmas holidays, and I was at my, my mother-in-law's house in Sacramento, and um, I was sitting on a parking lot. It was about the 28th, I think, of December, and um, I got a call on my phone. It looked like an international call. It was my friend Tim calling from Madras, India, or what's now called Chennai, India. He said, Danny, we need help. We've done an assessment. It was only, the tsunami had only happened two days before that. He said, we've done an assessment. And I said, what do you need? You want me to get a team to come out? He goes, no, we've already got teams of people. We've already got a bunch of our workers. We just need money, big time. And I said, man, I'm the world's worst fundraiser, but I'll do my best. And he said, well, just do your best, man. He says, we need $60,000 right now, and then we need this for tarps, and we need this to rebuild fishing boats, and we need this to help rebuild homes, and we need this for medical, blah, blah, blah. He said, we've already done this whole assessment, $60,000 now. Next week, we need another $120,000, and then we need this. And I said, oh, and I had such unbelief. I almost started crying because I like, God, I really want to help. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he says, what's in your hand? Anybody recognize that? It's Exodus chapter 4, verse 2 where God spoke to Moses, and he said, Moses, what's in your hand? And I said, well, Lord, what's in my hand? This is back in the old days. A blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, he said, make some calls. So I called Bill Stonebreaker. Now, this is Christmas holidays. A lot of pastors are off. I called Bill Stonebreaker. I called several other people. Uh, Greg Laurie gave me $8,000, and uh, some other church gave me 5000 Pastor Bill took up a big offering. Uh, and then I went on the radio and had money come in. Within just two weeks, we came up with a third of a million dollars, and we got to send all of it to India. And we had another one of our guys that was championing Thailand, and, another, uh, and our Koreans were championing Banda Aceh down in Indonesia. And uh, it all came out of a little thing, but I was a steward over what was in my hand. And even though I don't have a gift of fundraising, and I'm not the greatest, I always feel whippy and jerky when I talk about money in church. I don't know, maybe any healing or something, <laughs> therapy. But um, anyway, the, the whole issue of uh, what's in your hand and what's in your hand as we close. Your marriage is in your hand. Your kids, man, my kids are getting out of my hand. That's okay. You keep praying there. You keep hanging in there. Just yesterday, this is a little personal anecdote. Just yesterday, um, one of the young guys at the retreat came up to me and said, you're David Lehman's father, aren't you? I said, yeah. He goes, oh, man, he was wild. I said, yeah, I know. I said, <laughs> Was he hanging around you in his wild days? He goes, yeah, I was wild too. And I said, oh, we used to go out to Waipahu. I said, I know, I know what you used to do. <laughs> and his other guy was right with him, and he said, that's okay, I'm keeping him straight, man. We're going to Bible study in church. And I just went, oh, man, what a wonderful thing. Uh, that just, just, the, just to see the impact that that guy. And, and this guy had been led to the Lord by this other Hawaiian guy that was there at the, at the, at the retreat. And he just told me how he came to Christ and he was smoking dope and the Holy Spirit convicted him and, and they just gave all the glory to God. And I'm just going, man, he's got the whole world in his hands. And we need to be able to um, not only just kick back and let him do his thing because, you know, he's chosen to do his thing through us. And he's chosen to give us a stewardship of the faith, our own faith that we can grow in as we come close to God and let faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then we need to grow in faithfulness in our stewardship as we go to the Father and then we go to the world and we do everything, as Jesus said, I must be about my Father's business. Interesting, that word oikos and the word oikonomos from which we get our word house uh, steward is the same word from which we get our word economics. And it simply comes, you've got, it might not be money, but in, a, in an economic way, you've got capital. You've got Money capital, you've got health capital, you've got physical capital, you've got spiritual capital, you've got relational capital. And um, I think one of the things that benefits me as I get older is I know a lot more people. And a lot of times somebody will come up to me. I met a guy at the retreat yesterday. He said, uh, 
He said, hey, Danny, I'm really into kind of maritime stuff. You know anything about ships? I said, we got 21 ships. Why don't you come on over? We'll put you on one of our ships and send you to Papua New Guinea. You know, because that, that was some relational capital. So I'm hooking this guy up with some of our ship people, and hopefully they'll be able to see something come out of that. It's a wonderful thing to be a steward of your friendships and a steward of the authority God's given you. Whether you're on a job or something, you can use that stewardship and that authority God's given you to be able to reach out and just ask yourself that question, what's in your hand? Amen? So we want to be good stewards of the, of the mysteries of God, it tells us uh, here in Ephesians. I mean, here in 1 Corinthians. And we want to be good stewards of our gifts, as it tells us in 1 Peter. Amen? Well, thanks for letting me uh, preach at you. I hope you got something out of today's message. I'll meet you at the book table in the back. And uh, otherwise, let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for your grace and what you're doing around the world. We spent too much time on CNN and Fox News. We're going to get depressed. And... Uh, but we know that if we look into your word and we tune into the right channels, we can hear some really good things that you're doing. I thank you for the report I just heard yesterday about a church in San Francisco that's teaching the Bible verse by verse and has 1,800 young professionals in San Francisco coming to Bible seminars and just defying the whole situation of saying that young people don't read or study anymore. Lord, we want to say we want you to raise up a generation of people who go after God with all their heart and go after the world that he made with all their heart. Lord, bless us and help us to be good stewards of what you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.